Nintendo is having one of its best years maybe ever in history. In, in less than 18 months, they launched America's fastest selling game console of all time. Their market share jumped a staggering 13% and they released two of the best reviewed Mario and Zelda games ever made. But beneath all the surface level success, there's a crisis quietly raging inside of Nintendo that nobody is talking about. And in order to help you really understand what I mean, we need to go back. All the way back to the 2017 Nintendo Switch reveal. It was January 2017 and Nintendo had just given us our first real look at what to expect from the Nintendo Switch in a major onstage livestream. It was an hour-long event jam-packed with major announcements, all building up towards one final revelation, the official reveal of the next big 3D Mario platformer. And if you could pinpoint any moment in history that was the peak of Nintendo Switch pre-release hype, this was it. Nintendo was just about to show off the first traditional 3D Mario platformer in over 15 years. Finally, the moment arrived. The game was called Super Mario Odyssey, and it looked fantastic. And what's more, Nintendo was making some very lofty promises about this game being an open-world successor to games like Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine, something that fans had been requesting for over a decade. There was undeniably a lot to be excited about that day, but I could not shake the feeling that something wasn't right here. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, Super Mario Odyssey itself looked great, but there was one small thing that rubbed me the wrong way, and it had almost nothing to do with the game itself. My problem had to do with the hero. It had to do with Mario. Now for the best example of what I'm talking about here, we're gonna focus on one specific image of Mario. This is one of the few pieces of official artwork Nintendo released alongside Mario Odyssey during that January 2017 reveal. And at first glance, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is a pretty standard Mario. And from a distance, that illusion completely holds up. But scrutinizing this Mario gives way to an alarming revelation. Upon closer inspection, it becomes abundantly clear that this time, something is very different about Mario. This time, Nintendo had chosen to render every single hair on Mario's head in stunning, unflinching photorealism. And before we go any further, I want you to really sit with this image, really take it in, because at first blush, this addition of realistic human hair might seem harmless. So. Take it in, look at his face, then look at his hair. Back to the face again, now back to the hair. It's just wrong, it's too much. The sheer quantity and quality of hair on display here, the fact that each individual hair can be visually distinguished and isolated is just inherently unpleasant. It's, it's simply too much tactile visual information for the human eye to comfortably take in. And it produces this effect in the viewer that I'm choosing to call follicular trypophobia. Essentially the sense of intense repulsion brought on by the sight of thousands and thousands of irregular hyperrealistic hairs placed on top of a cartoon head. I've been obsessed with this image for as long as we've known about Mario Odyssey and, and I've never really been able to quite pin down what produces the feeling that I'm describing here. I, th I think that it has something to do with the way that the hair is from a distance shaped like a cartoon character's hair, but as you get closer is just this, it's made out of human hair, but it's constructed in a way that no human's hair could ever be constructed. You could not get human hair to be shaped like this Mario's hair. It couldn't happen. And what's worse, each of these hairs is so uh, fully realized that you could, you could essentially pick one hair from Mario's head and trace it, trace its path throughout his scalp back to its point of origin, which just should not, in my opinion, should not be possible. And that's just talking about the hair on top of Mario's head. The, the mustache is a whole nother subject, and it's something that needs its own sort of addressing here. It's especially odd because from a distance, like the hair, it takes on the exact bulbous cartoon shape of Mario's mustache as we know it. But upon further inspection, it reveals itself to be also made of hundreds, maybe thousands, of discreetly rendered individual hair strands. Now you'll notice that the artists at Nintendo have mercifully blurred most of this mustache with a tasteful depth of field effect, presumably to shield viewers from the horrifying visual impact that seeing a full bushel of vividly rendered Mario mustache hairs would have on, on an unexpecting viewer. But perhaps worst of all is the part they didn't blur, the part around the edges of the mustache, because if you look closely, Around the edges of Mario's mustache here are these sort of unkempt individual hairs, these, these tiny imperfections that seem to suggest that no, this is not a video game character, this is an adult man's human body hair we're looking at. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. You're wondering why I haven't mentioned the color of his mustache yet. And indeed, when I show this image to people, friends, strangers, Uber drivers, it's one of the first things about this Mario that pops out to them. His mustache is a completely different color than the rest of his hair. It's, it's a jarring, shocking difference. And it's a fair question to ask, why is Mario's mustache here such a dramatically different color from the hair we see on top of his head? Now, now this is one question about this Mario that I actually do have an answer for, and it's a fascinating one. See, to Nintendo's credit here, this is a real phenomenon. It's not at all uncommon for bearded individuals to have facial hair that is a slightly different color than the hair on their head. In, in the 16th chromosome of the human body, there's this one gene called MC1R, which makes a protein called melanocortin-1. If an individual inherits a mutated version of the MC1R gene, parts of their body can end up with follicles that erroneously produce that lighter colored hair, even if the hair on their head is primarily dark. But there's one major problem with this explanation, which is that the MC1R genetic mutation almost exclusively results in dark hair with light mustaches, not the other way around. Mario's combination of a dark mustache with light brown hair would be a legitimate medical anomaly. I think that's why when we look at this, his hair almost appears artificially colored or dyed. It's because the combination, like a light brown hair and a dark brown mustache, just does not occur in nature. Now, in order to try to figure out how much of a factor this color swap is in why this image is disturbing, I decided to perform a quick experiment. So I used the program Adobe Photoshop to see how this Mario would look with his hair color swapped. And unfortunately, the results were no less upsetting than the original, meaning we had to keep pressing forward. Now, Mario's eyebrows are a different story entirely because they seem to obey almost a completely different rule set from Mario's head hair and mustache hair. Mario's eyebrows here do have that standard sort of crescent shape that a typical cartoon character's eyebrows would have, and indeed the same eyebrow shape that Mario's eyebrows have historically had. But zoom in and you'll see that they're made out of that same ultra-realistic hair that you've seen all over the rest of Mario. The result of that combination of cartoon shape and realistic hair that we've seen on other parts of Mario is, is really brought in a stark relief in these eyebrows because the, the way that they're shaped and the way that they're so perfectly crescent-like, it, it almost belies this effect that the hairs have been woven in and out of Mario's skin with a needle, that it's not something that has grown on him the way the other parts of his hair has grown on him, but in, indeed something that was attached to his body in a, a medical, uh, perhaps violent way. Now, each of these individual pieces of Mario's hair, the hair on his head, the eyebrow hair, and the mustache hair, all share one major characteristic, and I think you may have caught on to it already, which is that they are sort of trying to look simultaneously cartoonish and ultra-detailed. And the result of that, unfortunately, for anyone looking at these images is, is disgust, is horror. But I needed to know, why, where does that feeling come from? Why does it suck so bad to look at this? Because as easy as it is for me to sit here and talk about which parts of this Mario are upsetting, I'm not a scientist, and I knew I needed to drill deeper on why exactly this was so unsettling. So, in order to do that, I had to seek out some professional help. So I reached out to Maya Matur, a renowned biostatistician at Stanford University. I reached out to Maya because in 2016, she co-authored an important study that pivotally demonstrated the existence of a long-held scientific concept the theory of the uncanny valley. Now, just in case you've never heard of the uncanny valley, here's a quick explanation from an expert. Yeah, so the uncanny valley is basically the idea that if you see a robot or some kind of you know animated being that looks very similar to a human but has some kind of imperfections that make it not human, uh, that that entity can actually be um, sort of dislikable, um, and it can provoke these kinds of weird feelings of eeriness or creepiness um, that you wouldn't get from just looking at a robot that is, like, not human-like at all, like a, you know, a, a very cartoon-like robot typically doesn't seem eerie to us. So I showed Maya the same Mario I just showed you, and I put the question to her, What what is it that makes this specific iteration so upsetting? Something called feature inconsistency can be especially creepy, and so that's um, a situation where you have, for instance, like the eyes that look more human-like than the rest of the face. And I think to me, that's what jumps out at me about this, um, you know, this first Mario that you sent me is that, um, you know, it has these like very realistic eyes, but then the skin is, and especially like the nose and mouth are, are much more cartoon-like. And so, um, you know, it can be the case that when we see something that has these features that are not consistent with each other, um, that can be something that keys us into that uncanny valley effect. Now, as much as I wish that this Mario was the end of this trend, that is unfortunately not where this story ends, not by a long shot. See, just 
two weeks after Hair Mario, as I've chosen to call him, was first unveiled to the world, I was passing the time looking at some official artwork from Mario Sports Superstars on the Nintendo 3DS, and I discovered something shocking. Nintendo had actually reverted back to classic Mario with his traditional cartoony hair. This, you'd think, might come as a relief, because briefly, it appeared that Nintendo had seen the error of their ways and were abandoning this sort of realism and instead choosing to select for societal sanity. If only it were that simple. See, Nintendo had, in fact, returned Mario's hair to the cartoony version that we had all fallen in love with, but bafflingly, they had now decided to use that same hyper-realistic simulated hair for his horse. Now, this juxtaposition between the soft play doh Mario hair here and this lifelike simulated discreet horse hair is really upsetting to the eyes and in many ways is actually an even greater sin than the original hair Mario. By introducing realistic hair alongside, but not on top of, a classic Mario, Nintendo is raising some really troubling questions about the nature of Mario's world. Now I think the best way to illustrate the problem with these two hair types coexisting is with a simple thought experiment. Imagine, just for a second, running your hands over the fur of this horse. The softness of it, the warmth, the familiarity of, of another living being. Now, imagine in the same universe, seconds later, lifting your hand from that horse and placing it upon Mario's hair. What would that feel like? Would it would it be hard? Would it be cold? It's a it's a truly hair-raising question. And and looking at Mario through this new lens as an, an inhuman being inhabiting a human's world, uh, I was tormented by a new thought. I realized, just looking at this image by itself, just looking at this Mario and this horse next to each other, uh, it's hard to explain why classic Mario is not disturbing, why he hasn't always been disturbing to us. I mean, he is a human being, sort of, but under any meaningful amount of scrutiny, the illusion crumbles. His hair isn't hair, his teeth are just sort of one big tooth, this this sense of dread sets in, and, and I, I needed to know, why do human beings have such a hard time looking at hair Mario and not, say, a much more traditional Mario? Why has Mario in general never bothered me before now? Here's Maya again. Yeah, so in terms of like the difference between, you know, very cartoon-like representations and representations that are um, sort of much closer to looking like an actual human, um, I think the difference really is in kind of whether whether the viewer is forced to try to uh, wonder, even if only for a split second, about whether the the thing that they're viewing is actually a human or something non-human, um, you know, something that's computer generated, for instance. And I think with with a very cartoon like Mario, there's no doubt, you know, you'd you'd see that, and even within a split second, you would categorize this as you know just a cartoon. With these very realistic Marios, you know, it's possible that, you know, glancing at the hair or something, you could have a very brief moment of feeling like maybe this is actually a human. Um, but then, of course, you, you look at it for a little bit longer and it's not. And so um, it's thought, you know, one theory about the Uncanny Valley is that um, that kind of confusion between categories could be something that causes the that feeling of eeriness. And so, um, so I think that's why, you know, we wouldn't expect that something, a very cartoon like Mario, uh, would be as unsettling as something like this. This actually explained a lot to me. It explained that sort of fight or flight response that I get when I see this Mario. I, if, if Maya is correct here, what, what's happening when we look at this Mario is a, a brief, almost microscopic moment of uncertainty about whether or not we're looking at a living thing. And then as our brain tries to categorize this Mario as human, and as our brains temporarily slot this Mario into the human category, we immediately panic because this Mario would be the most disturbing human, if he was human, of all time. Now, Horsehair Mario was also upsetting, but to be honest, I didn't really think about him again until the Nintendo Direct a few months back when Nintendo commemorated a huge Mario Tennis Aces info dump by dropping a ton of new artwork for the game. And at a distance, this art all seemed pretty normal, but upon closer inspection, the hyper-realistic hair was back, not on a character, not on an animal, but on a tennis ball. Now this, to me, was somehow the most troubling incarnation of this phenomenon yet. Some individual at Nintendo, or perhaps more frightening, the entire company, was so obsessed with photorealistic hair that they'd spent the better part of a year shoehorning it into every piece of official Mario artwork they could, even tennis. 
And with each passing month, the trend seemed to actually be worsening. Mario Tennis Aces is a great example, but even games that weren't out yet, like Super Mario Party or Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, if Mario was there, so was the hair. As this trend worsened and as the frequency of Nintendo hair appearances increased, my stomach filled with dread at what hair crimes Nintendo might commit next. Slowly, I came to a realization which was, I was utterly powerless when it came to knowing what Nintendo had up their sleeves in the future. As more games came and went, I realized that if I was to have any chance of predicting where Nintendo was going with this, there was only one thing left to do, and that was to look backward. And after spending a considerable amount of time wondering where Nintendo's newfound obsession with hair came from, I suddenly remembered I had actually seen all of this before, almost half a decade ago. Let's go back in time once again, this time even further to 2014. Now, with a brand new Super Smash Bros. game on the horizon, I had finally caved and decided to buy a Wii U, which was a temptation I had resisted for years. And impulsively, I, I walked into a GameStop that day, and there was only one version of the Wii U left at this store. There was a bundle. It was the Super Mario 3D World bundle. I remember it like it was yesterday. And while the memory was a bit fuzzy, the one thing I knew for sure was that there was something about the internal cardboard packaging of this bundle that freaked me out at the time. And it's almost impossible to find photos of this online. I really turned the internet upside down for two weeks trying to find some images of this. And right when I was about to give up, I, I remembered that there was a chance that I had maybe taken photos of this myself. So I went back through years and years of photos until I got to a date, November 13th, 2014, at 2.12 p.m., when I took these images. Images of a Wii U logo completely covered in, or perhaps made out of, cat hair. The more I, I stared at this, the, the more disturbing it got. I mean, my mind flooded with questions. Was this thing alive? Was Cat Mario's DNA inside of this thing? What, what would it feel like to touch this? Was it warm? Would, if you pet it, would you be able to feel it purr? I, what, what arcane power suspended the centerpiece of the logo in midair? Was that its heart or its brain? At any rate, I had repressed all memories of seeing this thing completely, but it raised a chilling possibility in my mind. Perhaps Nintendo's awful obsession with realistic hair had existed much longer than I'd realized going back to before the Switch existed and perhaps even further than that. The discovery of this image threw a monkey wrench into my timeline. Now, just how far back did Nintendo's obsession with photorealistic hair go? I continued to pour over official Mario artwork, but the more research I did, the more I couldn't shake the sense that I was missing something. That there was a huge piece of the puzzle that I did not have yet. Then, finally, while looking at some renders from Mario Party Star Rush, I had a major revelation. This was never about hair at all. This was bigger than hair. This was about detail. Look at the raised bumps on Monty Mole's skin here and how it juxtaposes with that untextured geometric monolith that is his single buck tooth. Look at the keratinous scutes covering the Koopa Troopa shell, highlighting the texture of the fused Koopa bone that evolved to protect it. Look at the unpleasant, practically fecal texture of this Goomba's feet, or the clogged blackheads covering Wario's nose. All of these things are, in their own way, disgusting, but none of them have anything to do with the thing I was so laser-focused on, which was hair. It, it was so much wider than that, and so much bigger than I anticipated. Shaken to my core by these images and this realization that this went beyond hair, I flipped back to the original Mario image that kicked this whole journey off, and sure enough, if you look closely, even closer than I looked the first time, there are hundreds, actually thousands, of grotesque, individually rendered pores covering every inch of Mario's skin. I thought back to what Maya mentioned about the eyes of robots and how that helps us determine their humanity, and I looked at Mario's and noticed that Nintendo had chosen to lovingly render discrete epithelial cells within the iris radiating out from his pupil. All of this came back to one crucial point. This was not just hair, it was detail that was the source of the horror, and that simple fact opened up a Pandora's box that needed investigating. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed, and I realized that I was in way over my head. I knew that this was more information than I could possibly process myself, and I needed to call in an expert. So I reached out to the foremost authority in this field, a pseudonymous blogger known only by the name Supper Mario Broth. 
Now, if you're not familiar with the name Super Mario Broth, you're at least familiar with his work. Super Mario Broth has been responsible for some of the most important discoveries in the area of Mario science, including revealing what the Mario Brothers would look like without mustaches, publicizing the shrinking head drowning animation from Mario Galaxy, and even noticing a single gray hair in another render taken from Super Mario Odyssey. With a resume like that, I knew that Super Mario Broth would be perfect for this mission. So I reached out, and just a few hours later, not only had Super Mario Broth responded, he had delivered to me dozens and dozens of examples of photorealistic Nintendo textures dating back as far as 1996, each one more disturbing than the last. I'll let him speak for himself here. Be Mario's color in this artwork from Super Mario Galaxy contains a number of polygons many times larger than the number of polygons in the rest of Mario's body. Lakitu's headset in this artwork is many times more realistic than any part of his actual body. This render from Mario Sports Mix gives Bowser realistic elbow wrinkles. Mario Party 10 is the first game to give extreme definition to Bowser's facial scales and separate his hairs at the root. Also in Mario Tennis Ultra Smash, incredible detail has been put into the boxing gloves on Bowser Jr.'s Koopa Clown car. Super Mario 3D World starts the trend of realistic stitching on Mario's hat. The entirety of the Luigi's Mansion this dark artwork of Mario's Mario from Mario 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 is no Mario 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 Now as I looked over these renders, I was forced to face a pretty devastating conclusion, which was Nintendo's weird fascination with hyperrealism in their pre-rendered artwork was not actually a recent development at all. In reality, Nintendo had been doing this for ages, decades even, and the creepiness of Odyssey-era Mario was simply a product of human technology finally catching up with Nintendo's long-running sinister vision. It would be a whole lot easier to compartmentalize this weirdness if it was merely relegated to promotional artwork, and for decades that's been the case, but See, that's the interesting thing about this. That is simply not true anymore. Remember that weird realistic Mario from the very beginning, the one that kicked off this entire journey? What's interesting about that Mario is that for the first time, that style actually carried over to the retail product. One needs to look no further than Mario Odyssey's pause screen to see the truth. Now look at this closely. In game, because of the distance of the camera, it's, it's much harder to spot. But take a look at pause screen Mario here. Look at the, the shirt and the overalls. They're photorealistic in a way that Mario's clothes usually aren't. Look at the, the mustache. It is detailed. It's, it's imperfect. It's made up of individual hairs. And at the edges, that same fraying of the hair to indicate their individuality is at play here. This Mario is important because it marks the very first moment that Nintendo was able to make their long-held fantasy a reality. The first time that after decades of rendering hundreds and hundreds of increasingly detailed characters in their concept art, they've been able to bring one into the real world. But it would be foolish to believe that they will stop here. See, all of this, to me, begs the question, what's next? What, As technology evolves, as we get more and more powerful game consoles for more and more realistic Marios, where does Nintendo draw the line on this? It, Ten years from now, will we see a, a Mario as realistic or worse than the one that we saw in Mario Odyssey's promo art in-game, on our TVs, in our households, in our living rooms, you gotta believe that this is just the beginning for them, that, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. But realizing that they had taken this Mario and put him for the first time in a video game led me to a, a chilling conclusion. This is the new Mario, and like it or not, he's definitely hair to stay. Thank you again to all of my Patreon backers for helping me make this video possible. Uh, if you would like to see more videos like this, you can head to patreon.com slash Babylonian to support these videos. Huge thanks to Maya Mathur for speaking to me for this video and to Super Mario Broth for contributing to the research in this video. If you'd like to see deleted scenes like my full interview with Maya, you can click either of these links to head to my Patreon page and see the behind the scenes footage. Um, also, if you enjoyed this video at all, you owe it to yourself to go to SupperMarioBroth.com and subscribe to his blog on Tumblr. It's one of my favorite things on the entire internet, hands down. Also, be sure to check out MarioBroth.RedBubble.com where you can get a wide variety of completely unique Mario-inspired t-shirts. Thanks for watching!